Yes, you guessed it. It is time for another Frequently Asked Questions Friday, otherwise known as FAC Friday. Yes, we're back for another Fact Friday. And yes, of course, I am wearing my trademark, very recently, trademark black shirt. All right, don't forget to subscribe, hit the notifications bell, go to Produce Like a Pro to sign up for the email list. And have you had a fun week mixing the song, The Gallery Young and Restless? If you haven't already, download the tracks. There'll be a link down there. And go and watch the last three days worth of videos where you'll see me break down the mix. I want to hear your mixes. Put them out there, put links down here. Let's talk about this. This has been a lot of fun. You're an amazing community. Thank you ever so much for helping each other out on this. It's been rather wonderful. So without further ado, let's get stuck into Fact Friday. When you edit tracks as you did on the toms, do you just leave them as is or print them to commit to the editing? When you say print, yes, you could print them onto a separate track, but I imagine what you're saying in Pro Tools is a DAW, you can consolidate the tracks, which basically means you've done all those edits, you put crossfades in, and then you consolidate it. It removes all of the edits and all of the crossfades. Do I do that? Yes, I will. However, there's a few instances where I don't quite do that. What do I mean by that? Well, let's just say I take a whole drum track, like a huge track, and I sit there and I edit it really finely, staying in group, but I edit it, get it the way I want it to sound, what I'll do is I'll duplicate that playlist. And then on the duplicate playlist, I'll add fades into the edit and then consolidate. So I have a consolidated, no edits, no crossfades drum track. And then underneath, I'll have a heavily edited one where I can go back and change anything easily. I like to do that. I don't save the take with the fades on it though. That would be an absolute nightmare. I remember, doing that a couple of times and going back to opening up a session of like a seven minute drum track that's been edited like beat by beat insanely heavily, all with fades in it. And back in the olden days of before like Pro Tools 10, that was like this. You'd sit there for like 20 minutes and it would be like searching for fade files and this window would come up and you go blah, 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 like Q1979922 and you just watch all these numbers and you just, sit there for like 20 minutes as it sit there as it sat there and found hundreds of thousands of fade files literally hundreds of thousands because it might be 20 tracks of drums and like a thousand edits or something stupid like that if it was some crazy long song and it's sitting there finding every individual fade file so Cut a long story short, that's why I don't do it. It puts too much strain on the computer. Why should it be reading all those fades? I will consolidate, but I'll have a track underneath that is edited that is cut up the way maybe I cut up a bar or two here and there, but without fade files so they don't have to load. If you are using your DAW, Reaper, Studio One, Cubase, Nuendo, whatever you use, let me know. Let us know how you do this stuff. How do you edit drums? How, do you consolidate? What is your process in editing? That'd be really cool to know. When working with music full time, how do you manage ear fatigue? That's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, how do I manage it? I avoid it at all costs. Um, I've been doing streams inside of the academy where we listen to mixes and we mix critique them and we talk about them with the community because people come on live and we have a chat. And it's been really wonderful. And what works really well with that is the ability for us to sort of share information. But I'm on there for two hours, two and a half hours with a pair of headphones on. So I just have to kind of bring the volume down, listen at lower levels, and then crank it if necessary. So I try not to, you know, put myself in a position where I'm listening loud for any length of time. Now, headphones can be very, very fatiguing, but in a situation like working with speakers, with those super loud, if I got monitors cranking here, like all three of these monitors is powered the Genelex, and they can be loud. The Focals can get really loud. And even the little Callies, the little Sixes, can get loud. They can get loud. So bear that in mind. The best thing for you to do is to just not monitor too loud too often. You can monitor loud for a few seconds, but don't just sit there and crank it out. When I was in Capital the other day with our Schmidt, we went into Studio C and listened to some amazing recordings in Atmos. And he had a dB meter in there. Steve had a dB meter and he was listening at 80 when I arrived, 80. And when he played it back to me, 
He pushed it like a dB or two, and it was plenty loud enough in an Atmos situation, 80 dB, plenty loud enough. So just be aware of that. Be cognizant of it. Try not to listen at loud volumes for long periods of time. And also, just as importantly, it's not even so much, well, it is definitely volume, but it's also what you're listening to. If you're listening to electric guitars with tons of like crunch on them for long periods of time, that can be incredibly fatiguing because it's all three to 5K. Snare drums, crack for two hours will probably completely ruin your hearing for several hours. You'll need to take a lot of time off to get that your, your hearing to recover. High mids are where your ears are most sensitive. Somewhere about two to three K to about five K. It's for me, it's like three, four, five K is really sensitive. Two K as well, obviously. But those are incredibly sensitive areas. So if you've got really aggressive, loud speakers in that range, you are going to suffer a lot of ear fatigue. Just be careful. Don't listen too loud for too long. And also don't listen loud to really aggressive high middly stuff for too long. That will blow you out super quick. Is it a good idea to use master bus volume automation to control how hard the signal hits the compressor? I love those kind of tricks. You can definitely do that. You can all, but remember also you can automate your threshold. You can automate your threshold so that, you know, if a section gets super loud and you don't want to compress it that much, you can bring the threshold up and allow it to get louder. So I think the best thing to do is to learn all of the different things that compression does. If you learn and understand how a threshold works, then you can bring up the threshold, let it get louder of a compressor. Maybe a limiter comes in afterwards and just shaves it off a little bit more aggressively just to control the peak peaks. Compression and limiting does similar things, but doesn't do the same thing. You know, a lot of modern limiters can really just shave off a dB off the top without necessarily giving you that pumping effect that compression not done that well can do. So that's a massive discussion, a big, huge can of worms. But my point is, is like, learn to use lots of different tools. There's no one size fits all. You can definitely bring your volume down on a, on a Pro Tools master bus, and it will bring things down going into your compressor plugin. But if it's small little changes and you're trying to keep the volume up, but you don't want it to compress as much, then you should automate your threshold. Does that make sense? What I mean is like, Here's my compressor on my master bus. The track gets louder. I want it to get louder because it's the chorus. I want it to get louder. I want it to be louder and more dynamic. But the problem is my threshold on my compressor is set for my verses where it was tickling the verses. Now the volume comes up and it's like, boom, straight over that threshold. And suddenly it's pulling down three to four dB when I only want one to two. So what should I do? I should automate my threshold. So in my chorus, I bring my threshold back up a dB or two, and that will let the volume increase and still give me a couple of dBs worth of compression. So if I want two decibels worth of compression from a loud to a quieter section, I can automate my threshold on my compressor. Now, I did a whole video on master bus compression. It's flying around here somewhere. Hopefully Matt will locate it or even young Eric will locate it so you can see some of the master bus tricks that I did. So check that out. It's a lot of fun. So I hope you're enjoying this amazing Fact Friday. Thank you for these amazing questions. Please give us some questions down below and we'll sift through them and come up with some more Fact Friday questions. Also, please hit the subscribe button and you can go to Produce Like a Pro. You can download those multi-tracks from the last three days and play with those and mix a song. Plus there's a whole bunch of other free goodies. In this new digital era with everyone listening to their music by streaming on computer speakers, earbuds, cell phone speakers, how do we mix and master our music? Does the listener expect our songs to sound good on these devices? What point of reference do we go by to get the right compromising mix? Interesting uh, statement, compromising mix. So you, you're meaning how do you make it so it sounds good on everything? Well, the first thing is excessive low end has never been good. So having really, really incredibly bad, muddy low end where you haven't high passed and created clarity down there is not going to work on anything, whether it be earbuds, cell phone speakers, laptop speakers, big speakers, medium speakers, small speakers, car speakers, uh, the mall speakers, you name it, you, you need clarity. Low mids, a ton of low mids are your enemy. If you're listening on TV speakers, I remember this specifically, I did two seasons as a staff producer for X Factor, and the first thing I was told was, make sure you don't have a lot of low mids because TV does not like low mids. I mean, this is from 
the TV producers that produce X Factor, American Idol, and all those big TV shows. I mean, they're music people. Um, so don't put a ton of low mids in there. You need clarity in your low mids. You need a lot of clarity on your low end, so there's a lot of high passing. So it's clean down there. The reality is, reality clarity, the reality clarity, the reality is on this little device here, an iPhone, you're not going to get 40 hertz, obviously. The speaker <laughs> is the smallest thing known to man. It's tiny, but they sound pretty good considering their size. They sound a darn sight better than my old AM radio used to sound like when I was a kid, my hand-me-down AM radio, and probably, frankly, better than my, my old, you know, Walkman with just the speaker on the front, which cost like 10 pounds. The point is making something sound good on them and big speakers is actually not as hard as you think if you have good clarity in the low mids, good clarity on the low end. Those are the things that would blow up speakers, but the reality is, is they won't be reproduced by those small speakers. Like I said, 20 to 40 hertz ain't happening on that. It's barely happening on monitors. The 20 hertz is only going to be on a sub. 20 to 40, you're really going to feel it down there. So you need to think about this stuff. If, the, if it's well mixed, it's not going to be an issue. The one thing I will say, the number one thing I'll say, and this is something I think Bob Horn is really good at, is high mids. Make sure your high mids are super detailed. Um, if I listen to those late 90s, early 2000 rock records, they sound dreadful, absolutely awful on small speakers. Go to like some late 90s, early 2000s, like, uh, band, like rock band, and the records sound like this. <laughs> You know, the mixers were like putting tons of overheads and cymbals to make it sound quote unquote exciting. It was all high midly and it sounds dreadful on small speakers. Absolutely awful now. It's just where we're at now. The way people mix now is so much better, so much more detailed. They're controlling the high mids and the high end. Some of the kids coming up now and some of the guys like you, guys and girls getting into this, are making some of the best mixes. We have guys and girls in the academy whose mixes are phenomenal. We just did a Feedback Friday last week, a live one, and there was a couple of mixes in there that floored me they were so good because of that, because people are very cognizant, they're very aware of what they're mixing for, and you're mixing for phones, Laptops, big speakers, mall speakers, and stereo speakers in your car. That's what's going on. And it's going to move into Atmos and the Aura 3D and immersive sound. And all of those things share one thing, really good detailed mixing. There's no more time for just like splashy kind of like, yeah, man, yeah. Now it's got to be really good. And it's a really is starting to move into some really exciting territory where you can really get stuck in and make some great, great work. So high mid detail, get in there. Make sure you shape the high mids and the high end, not just splash it all out. Get some detail in there. Remove excessive low mids. TV speakers hate it. Small speakers hate low mids. And then clean up the low end so there's definition. You get those things together, get a good mastering engineer on it, and you'll translate into every single system. Marvelous question. Are all the people in the academy doing this semi-professionally? Or are there, just like me, people with 40 plus hour, unrelated to music, jobs that do this as a hobby and try to get this hobby to the next level and maybe earn a few bucks with it at the end? We have beginners, we have intermediate, we have semi-professionals and we have professionals. We have everybody. We have a lot of people that come on the show and talk in there. Um, next year, we're going to do once a month, we're going to have a different leading professional in there answering questions. That's going to be a big one. Um, we do courses that you've seen with people, Brad Wood's courses in there, um, uh, Ken Sluter's courses in the academy. I have two courses in there. Plus each month we have multi-tracks. There's about 40, I think so far. We're rebuilding the site. We're going to relaunch in the new year. Um, there's tons and tons of stuff. The biggest thing I think we see in there is the people with a massive passion for music that just want to help each other. That's the biggest thing. I get the occasional negative kind of comment, but you know, it is so unbelievably occasional. Most people are just in there trying to help each other. It's phenomenal. And there's a lot of people like you that have full-time jobs, lots of people that are feeding families and putting kids through college who are also doing this. And then people that are at the other end, maybe they've retired, maybe they're not working quite so much. And then there's people up and coming who 
college kids, et cetera, that are trying to get multi-tracks to practice with and get tips from people. The one thing that happens is everybody gives a schnizzle about each other. Everybody cares. It's really, really phenomenal time. I hope you enjoyed this week's Fact Friday. It was a lot of fun to do. As ever, please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Don't forget to subscribe. Download the multi-tracks from this week. It was a three-part series with the gallery. It was a lot of fun to do. It's coming up to New Year's, so there's going to be a lot of fun things happening in the new year. It's been a wonderful year. You've been amazing. Thank you ever so much for um, hanging out with us and have a marvelous time recording and mixing.